Welcome back to the Drunk on Riding Stephen King Dissection Series. In this episode, brought to you in part through the patronage of Arya North, we are digging into the 1982 novel The Running Man, published under the Richard Bachman pen name, as well as its 1987 film adaptation starring none other than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Actually, you know what? Let's flip things a little bit in this episode and talk about the movie before we go into the book and its plot because, frankly, it is one heck of a movie. The Running Man was released November 13th, 1987, though it was supposed to have an earlier release. It was actually supposed to re be released that summer of 1987, but another Arnold Schwarzenegger movie was released that summer, one that you might recognize, Predator. I guess it was just the year of Arnold. <laughs> the Running Man grossed some $37 million on a $28 million budget, got some uh, mixed critic reviews, and has gone on to become something of a cult classic. For good reason, especially today, though we will get into that a bit more later on. Now, the, the movie depicts a U.S. that is a total totalitarian regime, this this police state that is either in the midst of or sort of following some sort of economic collapse, where food riots seem to be the norm and the government keeps people pacified with what amounts to cheap reality television. There's, there's actually this great line in the movie that sums up the situation rather nicely. You want people in front of the television instead of picket lines. Well, you're not going to get that with reruns of Gilligan's Island, but you can with The Running Man, a three hour long game show, reality show, event, spectacle that I think airs every single day in which convicts fight for a chance to be pardoned and get this, you know, beautiful vacation time or so or so we're told all while they're actually fighting for their lives and running from these rather colorful stalkers looking to cut them in half or electrocute them or melt their faces off. What it all boils down to is The Running Man is an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. What you think of as an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie is this. This this is the epitome of Arnold Schwarzeneggerness, especially from the 80s. There there are feats of strength. There there are huge action scenes. There are explosions. There are brutal fight scenes. And there are great one-liners, most notably the second instance of the I'll Be Back, met with this perfect rebuttal by antagonist Damon Killian, played by Richard Dawson, channeling his finest family feud moments, who says, Only in a rerun. What a beautiful comeback! How do we not have anything like that in the, in the other Arnold movies? I don't know, but side note on this, using I'll Be Back in this movie was screenwriter Stephen E. D'Souza's idea. He actually said to Arnold, you should use this as a catchphrase. Now you might remember Stephen E. D'Souza from another movie that he wrote, Die Hard, or perhaps Commando, the first movie to feature I'll Be Back. Yes, he worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger before, and yes, the man has quite the resume. But D'Souza's involvement here is where things really get rather interesting because, and if you've read the book and seen the movie, you probably know where I'm going here. But if you've only watched The Running Man, it might surprise you to realize that the book is as fantastically wildly different from the movie as you could possibly imagine. The book, which we'll get to, and it obviously came first, it's dark. It's depressing. And the original treatment for the film adaptation was also dark and depressing. It was actually, uh, apparently, a, a, a pretty loyal adaptation. See, this guy, George Linder, picked up a copy of The Running Man in the Hudson News in his, in his local airport. Well, you know, the, the local equivalent of Hudson News in your area. They, they always change the name for some reason, I guess, to make it suitable to that area. I guess not everybody has a Hudson. And he loved it so much that he sold his company, Quadra Wheelchairs, at the time the country's largest supplier of lightweight wheelchairs, to finance and option this movie. Another funny side note here, he had no clue Richard Bachman was Stephen King. 
I mean, very few people did at this point, you have to remember. This wouldn't come out for a few years yet. In fact, in an interview with Cinefantastique, Linder said this, I contacted the author's agent and was a bit taken aback to learn that he was asking a comparatively great deal of money for the option of a book which had less than 100,000 copies in print. I mean, who had ever heard of Richard Bachman? Belinda agreed to the $20,000 upfront payment and it also agreed to have an even larger sum given over to the author uh, if the movie actually ended up getting made. And then he found out that it was Stephen King. And yes, he apparently was rather happy. Now, if you've seen the movie, you might notice that Stephen King's name is nowhere near the movie. It's not mentioned. It is nowhere near. I watched this when I was younger, and I had no clue this was a Stephen King movie. Because the, the, the author's name that is referenced in the credits is Richard Bachman. King apparently didn't like what they, do, what they did with the story, so he didn't want his name anywhere near. And what did they do to the story? Well, they completely changed it. And that was all D'Souza's doing. Like I said, Linder had, had hired writers to adapt the book, and their, their adaptation was fairly faithful. But D'Souza, he knew better. Though the likes of Dolph Lundgren, Christopher Reeve, and Patrick Swayze were considered for the lead role, they were already looking at casting Arnold as the lead character. And Stephen King's book doesn't really play to Arnold's strengths. So D'Souza gave Arnold's character a completely new backstory. He tweaked the, the dystopian hellscape. He introduced the big bats, ones people could, as he put it, fall in hate with. He made the game show more game show-like, including adding an array of dancers choreographed by the one and only Paula Abdul. He consolidated characters, created new ones, refined the subplots, even put in a role for Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac. The treatment is so different, I actually thought that D'Souza just happened to write a script somewhat similar to The Running Man, and they put the two together just for licensing purposes. They're, 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 not, they're nowhere near the same movie, the same story. It's so weird. But I gotta say, despite the differences, and despite the fairly, now at least, generic feel of The Running Man as a film, it is fun. It's an entertaining movie. It's one of those it's one of those really great bad movies. You know the ones I'm talking about, especially from the 80s. Those kind of it's an action film that has these great one-liners and you just it's just fun, enjoyable to watch. Really the fact that I can say that is pretty surprising given the source material, which again is none of those things but also especially because of the behind-the-scenes trouble that the movie had. See, ha having multiple writers, that's not really that abnormal. Usually you have a couple passings, uh, you get a couple people to look over the treatments, you get a couple drafts coming in. But what doesn't usually happen is for a movie to go through multiple directors. And in the case of The Running Man, they actually went through five different directors. First up was George P. Cosmatos, director of Rambo First Blood Part Two who left over some budgetary issues. Interesting little thing here, D'Souza noted that in the draft he originally did for Cosmatos, there was really heavy Holocaust imagery, and like a lot of allegory about like, you know, Gestapo squads like rounding people up. Like, that's really interesting. Like what could have been, right? Then there was Alex Cox, who turned out to have other commitments, Carl Schenkel, who came and went, and Ferdinand Fairfax, who apparently wanted the movie shown to audiences to be the actual in-universe broadcast. Really rather meta and kind of a step ahead for its time. And production actually started with Andrew Davis, who would go on to direct Under Siege, The Fugitive, and a bunch of other similar films. Davis got in about a week of shooting. He filmed the hockey sequence that made it into the final cut, actually. But he almost immediately fell behind schedule and started coming up with ideas that the rest of the team just didn't really gel with. Here's how D'Souza put it in an interview he had with Screen Anarchy. Andrew Davis said, Listen, I have a great idea. At the end of the movie, when they break into the studio, they're cornered, they're trapped. Then Arnold reaches into his pocket and takes out one of the exploding hockey pucks, throws it, and kills the guards. Producer Rob Cohen and I look at each other and Rob says, That makes Arnold pretty shitty. 
He had this thing in his pocket for the whole movie where the whole supporting cast is getting killed and he uses it to save his own ass. We are not doing it. So he's canned and in comes Paul Michael Glaser, aka Starsky from Starsky and Hutch, who was recommended because of his experience working on Miami Vice. And who was actually approached earlier to direct the film, but he didn't think that there would be enough time to kind of set up and prep production. And But he came in and he finished it out. Now, before we jump to the book and start talking about the plot and everything, there is another interesting little anecdote from that interview with Screen Anarchy that D'Souza did. And uh, before I go into it, I really want to recommend you read that or listen to the interview, and I'll include the link below. Really go check that out. They add a, a lot more than just a little bit that I'm talking about. But this one that I want to pull out is one, another one of those uh, what could have been scenarios. Apparently, as they were filming, this special effects company came to the producers and kind of set up this, this um, tech demo of what would be computerized stunts. Yes, the beginning of CGI. How cool is that? It wasn't so great yet, and they ended up not actually using it for the film, but it, it gave D'Souza a really good idea. One somewhat um, built off of a scenario in the book, actually but also inspired by the movie The Sting, which I've never seen. I should probably rectify that. But in that, the two leads seemingly kill each other. Come on, hold and the audience, you know, as you're watching, you're like, wow, that's amazing. But you find out very quickly that the whole thing was a ruse. It's good. Now, if you've seen The Running Man, I really hope you have if you're watching this and listening to this. There's a big fake-out scene where Arnold and somewhat love interest, somewhat co-conspirator Amber, played by Maria Conchita Alonso, are seemingly killed by Jesse Ventura's Captain Freedom. In the final cut, we know that this is fake. We know that this is not real. There's no suspension. There's, there's, no, there's no tension. We don't really care. It's like, oh, they're doing this. This is just a little weird. But that's apparently not the case in the original cut of the film, as D'Souza lays out again in that in that screen arc anarchy interview. We showed the rough cut to like 700 people, D'Souza said. It has shot missing sometimes, and there's a black and white special effects image of Arnold, and a jump cut to the other guy's face. So out of like 700 people, 12 people say, I don't understand how they food the audience. Meaning, not us, the fictional audience. And because of this, some studio executive says, this doesn't work, but I have the solution. The solution being flipping the scenes, which, again, removes that tension. Imagine what could have been if we see Arnold and Amber get killed, and then we're like, what the hell? And then it turns out it was all the rules? That would have been great. D'Souza actually credits this change to why the film didn't perform even better at the box office. And after seeing it as many times as I have, I kind of have to agree, because, again, it's a fun movie, but that would have been something else entirely. But you know what? Enough about the movie. Let's talk about where it all began. The book. The Running Man is the last novel included in the Bachman Books collection. It is not the last Richard Bachman book to be published, and we will get to those others in time, but it was the last of the early ones. And interestingly, what I found interesting anyway, is the hints that Bachman is Stephen King in this story in particular are almost obnoxious. There's a character named Charles Grady, yet another instance of Can You Dig It? There's a character with a question mark scar on his forehead, just like in the very previous Stephen King book that came out, Cujo, and they actually visit the fictional town of Derry within this book. I mean, come on. How did you not piece this together at this point? It's, it, it's like he wanted to be found out, you know? It's worth noting The Running Man, which Stephen King says he, he wrote in about a week or 72 hours or so, to be exact, is the last of his pre-carry novels to be published, the others obviously being Rage and The Long Walk. And while I loved those other two novels, I rank them actually as some of the best of Stephen King's books, at least to this point, 
I can't say the same for the running man. And honestly, that I think that really comes down to sheer entertainment. As I mentioned earlier, the running man, it, it's a dark, it's a depressing story. And you know what? We're, we're just gonna, we're not gonna dig into the plot in a separate section. We're, we're gonna talk the plot and the book right here because they're so inextricably tied together. Because right from the start of the book, you realize that things are just bad. In, the, in, in that very first chapter, we found out that the main character, Ben Richards, he, he's just in this state of like hopeless despair. His daughter is sick with what seems to be the flu or, you know, a light touch of pneumonia, very easily treatable in our day and age. But it turns out penicillin is some black market drug and they have no access to healthcare of any way, shape, or form. And Ben Richards' wife earns money from pulling tricks on her back, as is referenced several times. Richards gets about $20 a week in unemployment, which, not surprisingly, does not go far at all. We also find out that everyone is glued to their televisions in this universe called Freebies, where... It's the law that every apartment has to have one, though they, they do call out that it's still not illegal to turn them off if you feel like it. thought that was an interesting little point. And on these free meal, on these freebies are shows like Treadmill for Bucks, which feature contestants with chronic heart and lung diseases just walking on a treadmill and trying to earn money just by staying on that treadmill. And they have to answer questions. If they answer questions, they get money deducted. The treadmill gets faster and faster. And the audiences applaud when the people drop dead of heart attacks. This is a dark world. But there's more. Books are looked at suspiciously. Nevada has a have one, kill one abortion law. There's talk of a housewife massacre of 2024, where, and, I, and this is a direct quote here, 200 police armed with Tommy guns and high-powered move-alongs had turned back an army of women marching on the Southwest Food Depository. 60 had been killed. And if you're not killed, the punishment for unlawful assembly is 10 years in a state penitentiary. And it's not just the U.S. that is bad. This, this whole world is just globally shitty. There are cannibal riots in India. France is under martial law. There's germ warfare in Egypt and South America. Nerve gas being used in the Mideast. The Pope is some sort of 96-year-old joke that they, that they laugh at. And the chief subplot of the story revolves around ever-rising air pollution. Sound familiar here? Because the so-called revised Congress rolled back regulations and allowed factories to just pump noxious fumes into the air constantly 24 hours a day seven days a week they, they make a point lung cancer is up like 700 percent everybody walking around has asthma or emphysema rich people get nose filters that they charge other people like three thousand dollars for or something like that but it only costs like six bucks to make again there's a lot of of re things reminiscent to today's day and age, like like uh, what is it the ep the the EpiPen, which costs like ten bucks to make, but they sell it for like seven hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So that research and development. God. There was also this fairly horrible quote that just struck a nerve with me. The trees were not dead this far north, murdered by the big poisonous smokes of Portland, Manchester, and Boston. But, uh, you know, I guess it's not all bad. As, as one character pointed out, they gave us freebie to keep us off the streets so we can breathe ourselves to death without making any trouble. Yeah, it's, it's very fun. You know, Richard actually tries to communicate this to the people. He tries to spread this information, let people know, oh, they're poisoning you. This is the reason that we're all sick. This is the reason we're all getting screwed over. But the state, the network, the government, they're all one and the same, edits his footage, edits his language, points him out as being the bad guy because they can. They control everything. They control the flow of the information. They control the information. They control the things that you see the information on. They control everything. It's as state-run as you can possibly get. And it's this world that we're dropped into. This 
this epitome of positivity here that I've just described. This Blade Runner-esque kind of world with floating cars and dying little children, where Ben Richards volunteers. In this, in this era of legal murder, he volunteers for this game show because he wants to provide for his family, and this is the only thing that he can come up with because his previous job, working for General Atomics, wiping nuclear engines off, he got fired from because he protested and wanted better shielding. That job actually left him sterile in the book. Yeah, there's, there's just so much. It just keeps getting layered and layered. It's this layer cake of just horribleness. And he volunteers for the show, and there's he, he knows that there's a good chance he'll die. Just just listen to the rules here. This is the these are the rules of the running man as laid down by Dan Killian, not Damon for some odd reason. I don't know why they changed the name. I guess Damon sounds cooler. You or your surviving family will win one hundred new dollars for each hour you remain free. You're given a twelve hour head start. If you last thirty days, you win the grand prize. One billion new dollars. Killian and Richards actually have a really good laugh right after that sentence is said because they're like, oh, nobody's ever made it to the end because it's completely rigged and you're going to kill the, the runners. Yeah, it's, it's great. And unlike the movie, the runners in the book can go anywhere. They're, they're just out in the public. They're out in the world. They can get on a plane. They can get on a boat. They can go wherever they want with one exception. They have to drop pre-recorded tapes into a mailbox twice a day. And that's basically how they track where the runners are and bring them down. And since they're out in public, they actually involve the public. In fact, the public is paid, as mentioned in this additional rule. A verified siding pays 100 new dollars. A siding which results in a kill pays a thousand. I just, it's like, it's, this this world is just unbelievable in its just depression state. Like, this is just a horrible world to have to live in. And people go along with it. But besides all of that, besides how sort of unreal that feels, the book is very tense. It's a very tense book. And I think part of that go is built on the fact that the entire book is written as a countdown. The very first chapter is minus 100 and counting. That's the title of the chapter. And the very last one is just triple zero. It counts down. Every every single chapter counts down. So it flies by. You just want to keep reading. It's very reminiscent of The Long Walk, and in which case, you know, there were 100 contestants at the beginning and the story counted down as each one was killed. Very similar fashion here. And I do have to say, while I, I mentioned the ending, Richards gets messed up in this book. It's nothing like the movie where he's just super strong, he's smoking his cigar, he's having a good little time. At the end of this book, Richards has been shot, he's been stabbed, he is holding his intestines, and they're just falling out of him. He trips on his own intestines. They get caught on a dead body, and he has to double back and free them up. It's horrible. It's horrifying. It's disgusting. I couldn't read that without cringing. But again, this book is not entertaining. Thought-provoking, yes. Infuriating, sure. Entertaining, no. Especially when you compare it to the movie, so I can get why D'Souza made the changes that he did. Though the two do share some similarities, uh, most notably in the rather open endings. I mean, in the movie, we have Arnold sort of killing the host of the show, participating in a coup, and in, in the book, he takes down the network with a plane, very reminiscent of 9-11. But what happens afterwards? Is there an actual revolution? Is there an uprising? Is the network gone? What comes in to fill the vacuum of power in these scenarios? Is it just a new network? Is it a new people? Is it a democracy? We don't know. We never get to find out. Though I tend to look at our world, our real world, as a model for what might happen in this sort of scenario. But before we get to that, you know what? Let's take a look at today's beer pairing. In a first for this show, and a first for the channel actually, the beer pairing today 
is a non-alcoholic beer. Athletic Brewing Company's Run Wild, non-alcoholic IPA, which is also why I'm able to record this in the morning and not feel like a total lush. Now, this looks like a beer. Looks like an IPA, it's got a beautiful color, it's got a nice little head on it, but when you try this, you immediately realize it is not an IPA, it is not an actual beer. It sort of tastes like a soda mixed with the flavor of an IPA. And it doesn't smell good. But I get it if you need a substitute for an alcoholic beer. And I'm a little disappointed I didn't get something more alcoholic to talk about my closing notes here because I think it probably could have helped a little bit. To say the running man is a bit prescient is really putting it lightly. I'm, now I'm talking both the book and the movie, both of which were released before the age of reality TV. An example of which our president, obviously, is most well known for. Today, we see a lot of that police aggression that's noted in the book, most notably in poorer areas, poor cities, um, low-income cities, where predominantly there are people of color. You see that police brutality all the time. Police shootings of innocent bystanders. People who did nothing but just be born with darker skin. And it's unfortunate. It shouldn't happen. We also live, unfortunately now, in an era of so-called fake news. An era in which the U.S. federal government consistently lies and has even gone so far as to release edited footage claiming that that was real. And that's not even going into the widening gap between the rich and the poor. You know, sure, we don't have nose filters and we have open access to everywhere. We can, we can see whatever information we have as long as it's not the president's tax returns. And we, have, we can go into the libraries without any sense of an issue. But in an era of deregulation, reduced public funding, and an almost casual indifference on the part of our government to other governments, other peoples around the world just committing terrible atrocities, how far off are we from these actual scenarios? Now, The Running Man, the book, is set in 2025. The movie is set in 2019. It's set in the now. Both of these might be from the 80s, but the message is certainly resonating now. And this plays into that bit of an open ending. What are we doing as a society to change these trends, to affect these trends? Hell, half of our society supports these trends. Half of our society wants a totalitarian government in the form of our current president. They want him to be this omnipotent ruler. There are those afraid now that if he loses the election next year that he won't cede power. That's that's an awful scenario to consider. In The Running Man, there's a violent uprising. There's a sense of some sort of revolution. But where's our revolution? Where's our uprising? Did they just perfect the freebie in the form of social media, of the internet, of Facebook? Are we so apathetic to the way things are that this is just the norm now? This is just the way things are going to be? And here's an interesting question, one that I want to pose you. If The Running Man were a real show, if this were a real event where convicts fought for a chance at freedom, but were fighting for their lives, would you watch it? If you got $100 for reporting having seen the runner, would you call in? You might get $1,000 if they actually kill him. How would you feel about that? Would you feel good? Would you participate? Or would you help that person run? In today's age, the age of cameras everywhere, could that person actually run? Would that be an entertaining show to watch? Would you watch this show? Could he run? Could we run? Could we be set up and thrown in there? You and I, 
could be the next people on The Running Man. Or, you know, just maybe tread fi- treadmills for dollars. Why not? I don't think I could last too long on a treadmill running for dollars. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, this has been the Drunk on Riding dissection of Stephen King slash Richard Bachman's The Running Man. In the next episode, we're going to talk Creep Show, both a comic book and a somewhat unique movie. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Please give it a thumbs up. Please leave a comment below. If you are listening to this on podcast services, please leave a positive review. Yes, we're on podcast services now. Isn't that cool? But until then, until next time, please be sure to go to drunkonwriting.com. I didn't mention that. And as always, cheers and keep on writing.